Sevia, baby. She's good. Best sugar-free carbonated drink ever. Man, some of you all are persistent. What was that noise there? First of all, I, for those living in the Midwest, man, what the fuck is up with this weather, man? How can it be like 70 degrees one day and two days later it's like 25 degrees? What the fuck, man? I mean, man, I mean, I should know this from living in the Midwest for a while, but damn, man. That should be fucking with me, man. That's why I be having colds and flus and shit, man. I mean, just give me some consistency here, man. Fucking extra long winter and shit. It's snowing today in the fucking Chicagoland area. It's fucking snowing, man. In like mid-April. It's fucking snowing. What the fuck? Anyway. Um, some of you motherfuckers are persistent. I give you that. Whether that's a good thing or bad thing, some of y'all persisted. Okay. You know, I always got to bring up my my fellow Negro Manosphere writer, Tony Maceo. Speaking of Negro Manosphere, you'll see some in the comments section. It hasn't been announced officially yet. But O'Shea Duke Jackson, the editor-in-chief of the Negro's Ma NegroManosphere.com, will be officially announcing it in a few days or two or three weeks. But you'll see a preview of what he's going to announce in the comments section. <laughs> yeah, Alan Roger Curry is about to get some accolades. Um... But yeah, you know, as I've repeated multiple times, my brother Tony Maceo, anytime I say something that's somewhat boastful, egotistical, narcissistic, or just generally representative of me tooting my, my own horn, he, he calls that me rubbing my balls in men's faces. Now, a lot of times I don't intentionally try to rub my balls, but every now and then, yeah, intentionally. But no, I'm going to say this, man, as if it needs to be said. I've been a dating coach for over 10 years. I've been a professional dating coach for over 10 years. Okay. I came out with my first ebook version of Mo One in 1999. I would say I've been a very active and even dominant presence in what is now known as the Manosphere since at least 2002, 2003. My starting point on the internet was a place called askmen.com. Askman.com, they banned me like seven times from that message board because I became so popular. I have people write me to this day calling me an Askman.com message board legend because I hit the ground running when I start posting there. From there, I start posting on a site called directmethod.com. It was very popular for about a, at least a two, three, four year period. Then it went defunct. That's where I first connected, uh, I think, with David X. It was while I was on uh, directmethod.com, or I should say that's where I first heard about him. Um, that was the second major place I used to post that I made a name for myself. Then, of course, starting with 2007, I started doing my blog talk radio show that I did for nine years, and now I've been on YouTube for just over a year. Let me say this to you fellas, the, the, the ones who want to challenge me. If Alan Roger Curry 
could be faded. Don't you think he would have already been faded? I mean, seriously. Really? I mean, seriously. Don't you think if Alan Roger Curry could be faded, he would have already been faded? The number one evidence that I cannot be faded is the fact that I haven't been faded. And trust me, I've had more than my share of challengers. More than my fair share of challengers. Even my brother has even had to give his younger brother some admiration and amazement. You know, the, the, my brother doesn't like when I share my, my private conversations with him publicly, but I, I try only to share a few. But even he once told me, and, I, and this is serious, my brother once told me, he, he said one time to me, he said, man, bro, I don't know how you do it. I said, what? He said, man, you've had a ridiculously high number of motherfuckers come at you on both a personal level and on a just strictly in relation to the contents of your books. He said, man, the normal motherfucker would have folded by now. He, he even basically admitted, he said, dude, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, I don't think I would have been able to, to deal with the shit you've dealt with publicly on like message boards and discussion forums and social media in terms of how many people have attempted to undermine either your credibility as the messenger or undermine the credibility of your message, i.e. your Mo one approach. He was like, dude, I, 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 I don't know. He said, that would have drove me crazy, man. He said, but being your brother, I've witnessed you, man. I've witnessed the people who have tried to challenge you, you know, basically throw haterade on you left and right. hurl an enormous amount of personal attacks your way and you still stay strong. That's because, man, number one, I'm a resilient motherfucker. I already told y'all a story. I, I saved myself from dying at least once. I was in an unexpected fire and I had to save my own life because the fire firemen hadn't got there yet. So that right there shows you I'm a resilient motherfucker. Um... But yeah, man, somebody, I had at least two people just over the last, what, 72 hours try to challenge me. Some dude uh, uh, in the last 24 hours on Facebook trying to say that uh, Eric Von Markovic's mystery method was more effective than Alan Roger Curry's mole one approach. And that mole, the mole one approach only cause you to hook up with unattractive women and or fat women. Insert doll face here. You know good and well. Y'all motherfuckers coming at me like that. Y'all know good and well. Y'all ain't never ever seen Alan Roger Curry step out with no woman that was hard on the eyes. And my close friends particularly know that. My fraternity brothers know that. Come on, man. See, that's the thing about Facebook. You know, there's some things I don't like about Facebook. But here's the one thing I say about Facebook. Here's the one thing I say about Facebook, particularly for a guy like me, a person who's like a, um, a self-help guru slash dating coach. When you're on Facebook, it ain't like you're on some kind of anonymous message board. Meaning that a large number and percentage of people who are my Facebook friends are people that went to middle school with me, high school with me, college with me, have worked with me at different jobs, have hung around me socially. In other words, they know me in real life. It ain't just motherfuckers who I've interacted with on, on via the internet. Large number and percentage of people who know me, who are connected with me on Facebook, they know me in real life. So don't you think... If I was just a major fraud, a motherfucker who was acting like I pulled eights, nines, and tens, but really I was only pulling three, fours, and fives, don't you think a motherfucker who went to high school with me, college with me, or who knows me in real life would call me out on that shit? Come on, man. Use your brain, man. 
If I was perpetrating a fraud, man, somebody who knows me, who's interacted with me in real life and has seen the quality and quantity, quantity of women I've dealt with in real life would have called me out by now. I've been on Facebook since 2008. Trust me. And my, anybody know about being in a fraternity, if you're in a fraternity, my, my fraternity brothers are real as they come. <laughs> Trust me. Now my, my fraternity brothers are real as they come. So in other words, if I was a motherfucker that during my college days wanting shit, was pulling nothing but ugly and obese women, I guarantee you, at least a handful of my fraternity brothers want to call me out on social media. They would have been like, come on, Alan, man, why are you fronting like you be pulling fine babes? You know you know, in college you didn't pull nothing but, but ugly women and, and women that was 80 pounds overweight. Come on, man. If I could be faded, I would have been faded. Okay? Believe that shit. If I could be faded, I would have been faded already. Anybody gonna ever fade more than one? Anybody gonna ever fade more than one? Even after I die, ain't nobody gonna ever fade more than one. That's my legacy, motherfucker. Believe that shit. Even after I pass away from this earth, ain't nobody going to fade more one. You can try, and trust me, many have. I'm talking about literally thousands. I ain't talking about dozens. I ain't talking about hundreds. I'm talking about since roughly the late 90s up until now, I've literally had thousands of people attempt in one way or another to undermine the credibility and or effectiveness of the mode one approach. And all of them have failed. All of them. All of them. I'm not, I didn't say all of them except for two or three. I said all of them. I even, on one message board, I even issued a monetary challenge that nobody was, I said, if you can prove factually that the mode one approach is incredibly ineffective, I will PayPal you a thousand dollars right now. I will PayPal you a thousand dollars right now. How, you know how many people I had take me up on that challenge? Zero. Zero. Because you can't fade more one. Yeah, this is this is a video where I just came primarily to talk shit. To tell you that y'all can't fade more one. You ain't gonna never fade more one. Because again, if Mo One could be truly undermined, could be proven to be just basically bullshit, it would have been proven five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And, if, and for those of you who remember the infamous website PUA Hate, PUA Hate, man, you know PUA Hate actually ended the careers of a lot of pickup artists and dating coaches. Some of y'all might not know that. I know some of y'all not even familiar with what PUA Hate was. PUA Hate, for those that didn't know, at one point, PUA Hate was arguably the most dominant, popular website in all the manosphere. That website, that it was a it was a message board full of a number of different discussion forums. At one point, I want to say that message board used to attract an average of a million visitors per month. A million or more visitors per month. Yeah. PUA hate man went no Rudy Poop message board. Like, I know a lot of message boards that might attract 25,000 guys a month, 50,000 guys a month, even maybe 100 or 200,000 guys a month. PUA Hate was attracting over a million dudes per month. And motherfuckers wonder why I used to go over to PUA Hate, even though I had nothing but haters and critics over there. Shit, all that exposure? Are you kidding me? Shit. You know, there's a saying in the advertising and marketing industries, uh... Bad publicity is better than no publicity. 
<laughs> it's true. Bad publicity is better than no publicity. In other words, when I was on PUA, when I used to go over to PUA Hank from time to time, I would I preferred that people be talking about me in a negative, insulting, or critical manner than for people not to be talking about me at all. Because if people weren't talking about you at all, that meant you weren't nobody. That meant you weren't, you know, you weren't a major player in the in the manosphere. Like if somebody brought up your name, let's say you were a dating coach name, I don't know, Joe Johnson, and somebody had said, hey guys, what do you think about Joe Johnson? And nobody responded, that means you were nobody. That means nobody gave a fuck about you. They didn't like you, dislike you, they just didn't give a fuck about you. To me, indifference is worse than being disliked, believe it or not. A lot of people don't realize that. It's worse to have people be indifferent. Like, matter of fact, speaking of my frat brothers, I had a frat brother tell me that. I hung out with some of my frat brothers a couple months ago in Chicago. And that's what one of my frat brothers said to me. He's a, he's a successful entrepreneur, millionaire, I want to say. And uh, he told me that. He said, he said, Alan, well, actually, most of my frat brothers, they call me AC or ARC. They don't call me Alan. Yeah, they either call me AC or ARC. And he said, man, AC, man. He said, here's one thing I say about you, man. I, he said, you think I don't be watching you. I'll be watching you on social media. I said, oh, I bet you do. He said, he said, man, I, I ain't gonna lie, man. Don't get mad at me. He said, man, I don't agree with everything you say. I said, oh, I'm not surprised. He said, because I'm going to be real, man. He said, sometimes I like to lie to bitches, man. <laughs> That's what he told me. He said, sometimes I like to try to get women in bed by lying to them. He said, so I, I, ain't, I ain't totally on board with your promotion of this whole being upfront, straightforwardly honest about the fact that you just want to fuck a woman. He said, man, I, you know, at least half the time, I, you know, I lie to women, man. So I tend to disagree with you. But he said, one thing I say about you, man, he said, you make it hard for motherfuckers to ignore you. He said, you always get a reaction. It might not be a positive reaction. It might not be a reaction of, of, of agreement. It could be people are disagreeing with you. But he said, the brilliance of you is you know how to provoke a reaction. He said, man, that's, that's brilliant. He said, that's, that's when you know you're a motherfucker, man, when anything you say is going to provoke a reaction. He said, motherfuckers are not indifferent towards you. And yeah, man, people used to dog me out on PUA. Hey, they used to try to challenge and try to undermine Mo One. And, and not regularly, but at least semi-regularly, I would go over there and talk shit to these internet trolls and shit. But none of them were able to fade me, man. Matter of fact, you know, one time I went into the lion's den and faded, so shut so many of these trolls up that some troll made up something and had me banned for a couple weeks. I remember I had to write to the manager of the, of, of the website. I said, dude, what, why did I get banned? And he said, well, technically you violated X, Y, Z rule. But he said, if I'm being honest with you, he said, man, you, you was killing, man, all your haters, man. He said, you was killing them, man. You, you was making them look bad, man. They thought they was going to make you look bad. And you was making them look bad just by asking them questions. That's why I got a nickname. Uh, one of my nicknames on there was questions, questions, and even more questions. Questions, questions, and even. See, that's a little tip for you people. If you want to break somebody down, sometimes you can break a motherfucker down just by asking them very simple, straightforward, specific questions. You can, you can have people frustrated just by asking them questions. I've seen people do that in interviews. Like real skilled interviewers know how to do that. Tim Russer, a guy I used to idolize, used to be on NBC's Meet the Press. He knew how to do that. He knew how to break people down just by asking them very simple, specific, straightforward questions. That's what I would do at PUA Hate a lot of times. I knew how to break people down just by asking them questions. I give you a simple one. This is a pretty simple question I ask a lot of guys. If you approach a woman 
And you know that the only thing you want to do is fuck that woman. Why are you wasting over 15 minutes, a half hour, an hour pretending like you don't? What's your most compelling reason for pretending that you don't want to fuck a woman when you know damn well that you do? A lot of motherfuckers don't know how to answer that shit. Or they give me answers that I can quickly have a quick comeback for. That's, that's, matter of fact, that's the basic question of my original book, Mo One, is that if you're if you're in conversation with a woman, and you know that your number one priority is to fuck her, that you really don't care about going to the movies with her, you really don't care about having dinner with her, you really don't care about walking in the park holding hands with her, like ninety to ninety nine percent of the reason you want to share that woman's company is to fuck her. Why are you trying to hide that shit? Why are you trying to pretend like? Like you care about all like her favorite movies or favorite foods and all that other bullshit. Huh? Why are you doing that? <laughs> Why are you doing that? Why? Y'all better recognize the motherfucker you listening to. Most of my Patreon subscribers, they know who they listening to. Most of my longtime followers know who they listening to. Some of you mother motherfuckers better recognize who the fuck you listening to, man. You ain't listening to no Rudy Poop motherfucker talking to you, man. You listen to motherfucker that been around Hollywood celebrities, been at Hollywood parties, man. Been around the cream of the crop of highly manipulative and materialistic women in my life. Been around some of the most gorgeous women that any man could ever be around in their entire life. Dude, I had a mother and daughter sucking my dick. Like enough fucking said, man. So y'all better recognize who the fuck you listening to, man. I helped a motherfucker in Hollywood have a threesome with a well-known celebrity that if I said a name, y'all be like, damn, are you serious? But I ain't going to say a name. But this motherfucker, from my consultation, had a threesome with a, uh, like a, I don't know if I'd call her A-list celebrity, but she's at least a B-list Hollywood celebrity. She's pretty well-known. So y'all better recognize, man, again, if I could be faded, I would have already been faded, man. What's that? What rap song is that where the guy says that? You don't understand. Oh, DJ Quick. You remember? I mean, I actually met DJ Quick, man, at the Burbank Airport. We rapped for a while, man. He's a good brother, man. He's a good brother. But I don't know if y'all in all oh, some of my non-black listeners, or even some of my black listeners may not be into rap and hip-hop. But DJ Quick, he was real popular in the 90s, man. And he had this, he had one of his favorite raps, at least one of my favorite rap songs of his was, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. And man, his message, matter of fact, now that I'm thinking about it, his message in that song was similar to my message right now in this video. He was basically like, man, y'all better recognize who, who dropping these lyrics on you, man. Y'all might think I'm like some kind of C-list or B-list rapper, but he was basically saying, I'm here to tell you, man, I'm an A-list rapper, man. And he was his message was, y'all can't fade this. But I give you points for trying. Here's what I say, and then I wrap up, man. Here's the reason why Mo One will never be faded. Here's the reason why Mo One will never be faded. Y'all know my four archetypes. Reciprocators, rejectors, wholesome pretenders, slash erotic hypocrites, and manipulative time wasters. Now for reciprocators and rejectors, I'll be the first to tell you, there's a bunch of methods out there that other dating cultures promote and and pickup artists and seduction 
gurus promote that will help you identify a reciprocator or a rejecter. I mean, I'm I'm just gonna be real. That so Mo One doesn't give you any any particular special upper hand when it comes to identifying reciprocators and rejectors. There's a bunch of different methods out there that'll help you identify a reciprocator or a rejector in a reasonably, you know, not too lengthy period of time. But when it comes to these three archetypes, when it comes to quickly and effectively, emphasis on those two words, quickly and effectively identifying women who are wholesome pretenders, erotic hypocrites, and to refresh your memory, erotic hypocrite is basically a woman who's a more pretentious, materialistic, gold digging, and argumentative variation of a wholesome pretender. That's an erotic hypocrite. So they're essentially the same thing. It's just that one is, is more of a gold digging version and more of an antagonistic and argumentative version of a wholesome pretender. That's an erotic hypocrite. And a manipulative time waster. When it comes to identifying women who fall into those archetypes, I'm going to say emphatically, which is O'Shea Duke Jackson's favorite word. He loves me to say emphatic. I'm going to say emphatically, as I've said for the last probably 20 years, there is no method of dealing with women out there that is more effective than mode one when it comes to quickly and effectively identifying wholesome pretenders, erotic hypocrites, and manipulative time wasters. If you think you could prove me wrong, I invite you to. If you think you could prove me wrong, I, I invite you to. Because trust me, I done heard, I done heard literally hundreds of challenges when I've said that before. Okay, I give you a couple examples. One of the most predominant when it comes to identifying of well, not so much identifying, but avoiding manipulative time wasters. Some men and like a lot of MGTOW types, they say, well, Alan, I get one better for you. What about just like not approaching women at all, waiting for them to come to you? That's what I do. I'm MGTOW for life, and I don't approach any women, man. I don't approach any women. Like all the women I fucked, I let them come to me. I let them make the first move. That way, I did not get rejected at all. I didn't have to put my ego on the line like George Clooney. That's a reference I say in some of my workshops that George Clooney even admitted that he was what I call a mode three timid. Yeah, he admitted in a Playboy interview that, that he was fearful of rejection. He said one of the reasons why he wanted to become rich and famous was so he wouldn't have to be rejected by women. George Clooney, a guy that most women consider smooth and handsome and sexy, this motherfucker admitted in a Playboy interview that he's terrified of rejection. Terrified of it. I know a lot of celebrities who are terrified of rejection. That's why a lot of guys, like I've, I've read a couple interviews where professional athletes have said that. That one of the reasons why they wanted to be a, a popular athlete was so they wouldn't have to make the first move on women so that women could come to them so that they wouldn't have to deal with rejection. A lot of guys, you'll be surprised. There are a lot of guys who are good looking, got a muscular physique, got six figures or seven figures in a bank that are terrified of rejection from a woman. Terrified. That's what I call mode three timid. Anytime you're scared of getting rejected, that means you're a mode three timid. Now, I don't like rejection. There's a difference between not liking it and being afraid of it. I don't like rejection, but I ain't afraid of it. I ain't afraid of it. But anyway, yeah, I've had some guys, including, like I said, a lot of MGTOW types, one of their challenges is they say, yeah, the number one way to avoid rejectors and manipulative time wasters is to simply not approach women at all, wait for them to come to you. 
And they're 50% correct. They're 50% correct. You will. If you don't approach any woman, women at all, you're right. You'll never be rejected. That's true. That's true. You won't. If you never approach women at all, you'll never be rejected. If you never approach women at all, No, I can't say if you never approach women at all, that would guarantee you won't deal with a, a, a manipulative time waster. No. No, that's not a guarantee. Just because a woman makes the first move does not automatically mean she's a reciprocator. Believe that shit. <laughs> Believe that shit. Just because a woman makes the first move, just because a woman is the first one to initiate a conversation with you and even you know go as far as to flirt with you, doesn't mean that she's not an attention whore, a cock teaser, or a manipulative time waster. I mean, come on, man. Haven't you been in a strip club where a stripper might come to you first? She might come over and start flirting with you first? She might make the first move to initiate a conversation with you? Does that mean she's not a cock teaser? Shit, all strippers are paid cock teasers. What are you talking about? So just because a woman makes the first move on you, don't mean that she ain't a manipulative time waster. Just because a woman makes the first move with you doesn't mean you have the verbal communication skills, the conversation skills, and verbal seduction skills to get her pussy wet and get her to want to fuck you. Shit, when you go to McDonald's, an attractive woman might say, how you doing today? How may I help you? May I take your order? She might talk to you first. Does that mean you're going to fuck her? Does that automatically mean you're going to fuck her? Because she started talking to you first? I'm trying to stop myself. It, 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 insert dog face here. Come on, man. So, and that'll work. And the bigger thing is, not only... The only thing you can say that not approaching women, period, will accomplish is it will prevent you from being rejected. Maybe. Well, see, I can't even say that. Again, just because a woman... No, see, yeah, I got to think about that. I, I used to kind of concede that it will prevent you from being rejected, but that's not necessarily true. If a woman, just because a woman initiates a conversation with you, again, using my stripper example, just because a woman initiates a conversation with you doesn't mean she automatically wants to fuck you. So that's not true. That's not true that uh, just because a woman approaches you first means she wants to give you some pussy or initiates a conversation with you. So, see, that that's wrong. See, I, I had almost given, was tempted to give more credit than credit was really due. Yeah, so... But that's one of the number one challenges I've gotten from guys is guys will say, well, if you, if you don't approach women at all, you ain't got to risk being rejected. Nah, that, that ain't 100% true. That might be true to a certain extent, but that ain't 100% true. What else? I'm trying to think of at least one or two other major challenges I've had regarding to the Mo One approach. Well, here's what I'll tell you simply. Here's what I'll tell you simply. My brother has said this for years. Starting with, I want to say, the mid to late 90s. My brother told people this even more frequently than I did. Mo One is not for everybody. The Mo One approach is not for every, every man. So that I will say. It's not for everybody. Yeah, again, I've said that for probably the last 20 years. And I would say my brother has probably said it for even more frequently than I have when he's talked to guys about Mo One. Mo One is not for everybody. As effective as it is, it's not for everybody. And I, I can tell you right off, and most of you know from reading my books, the main two types of guys who I would say Mo One is not for. Speaking of, I was just talking about rejection. If you're a man... Who, who does not, cannot handle being rejected, particularly in front of people, 
You cannot handle being rejected and particularly in front of people. Like say a woman might reject you in front of her one or two of her girlfriends or some other people who might be in the vicinity. If you can't handle rejection and even more particularly public rejection, Mo one ain't for you. Mo one ain't for you. So that's one type of guy I would say Mo one is not for. If you can't handle public rejection, and secondly, I'll say abrupt rejection, like quick, straightforward, abrupt rejection. If you can't handle one of those two things, Mo one is never going to work for you. Because see, what Mo one does is this. And this is why a lot of guys prefer Mo two. What Mo two does is for the women who are not interested in you, it helps delay rejection and minimize the sting of rejection. Let me repeat that. One of the benefits of Mo two versus Mo one is Mo two helps you delay rejection and minimize the sting of it. But what does that open the door to? Of course. Um, so yeah, if you can't handle public rejection or abrupt rejection, why do you think guys pay me money for email consultations, Skype, and telephone consultations, and one-on-one face-to-face? Excuse me, burp number two, I think. One-on-one face-to-face coaching sessions is to help them overcome the effects of rejection. That's one of the major things I do with my clients is I help them overcome. Because if you can't, if you can't handle rejection, Mo one ain't gonna never benefit. You ain't gonna never be able to consistently be Mo one. Number two type of guy that Mo one is not for. Let's say you got enough confidence to initiate approach a woman and initiate a conversation with a woman. So you got it going on in that area. But once you do initiate a conversation with a woman, all you do is engage in flattering, entertaining, non-threatening, conventional type conversation, trivial small talk. You don't have the boldness to straightforwardly express what your true desires, interests, and intentions are. Because you're afraid of being criticized, you're afraid of being insulted, and you're afraid of negative reactions from women. That's the second type of guy. Mo one ain't gonna work for you. Mo one ain't gonna work for you. So if, if at minimum, if there's two types of guys, Mo one ain't gonna help you. If you're a guy who is profoundly negatively affected by rejection, and you're not willing to to work on overcoming that, Mo one ain't gonna work for you. If you're a guy who's pro, who really cares about what other people think and you're profoundly affected by being criticized by women, insulted by women, or receiving negative reactions from women, and you're not willing to, to work on that, work on overcoming that, Mo One ain't gonna never benefit you. So all two types of guys, Mo One ain't gonna never help you. Ain't gonna never help you. In order for Mo One to benefit you, you have to reach a point where you become completely unfazed by rejection and particularly public rejection and quick, straightforward, abrupt rejection. And you have to be a guy who overcomes the negative effects of being criticized, of being insulted, and of, of just generally receiving negative reactions from women. Because anytime you say something that's really bold to women, audacious, provocatively straightforward, sexually explicit, there's at least a 50% chance a woman's going to give you a negative reaction to that shit because you're challenging her sensibilities. You're challenging her social programming. So it's inevitable that she's going to have a negative reaction to that shit. Do you know a high percentage of women I've had casual sex with in my life initially 
gave me a negative reaction. Like even my infamous story of the woman who sucked my dick in a grocery store. She didn't just quickly say, oh yeah, I'm attracted to you. I want to get on my knees and suck, you suck your dick. No. She gave me at least five minutes worth of shit before she sucked my dick. She gave me a negative reaction. Most of the women I've had uh, casual sex with, particularly my same day seductions, I would say probably at least 70, 80% of my same day seductions with women, the women initially gave me a negative reaction and they initially expressed all kinds of criticisms and insults of my behavior. If you can't handle being criticized by women, you can't handle being insulted by women, you can't handle receiving some degree of a negative reaction from women, more one ain't going to help you. But again, I'll say this emphatically. When it comes to helping a man quickly and effectively, quickly and effectively identify wholesome pretenders, erotic hypocrites, which are women who are down to have sex with you, but because they want to protect their image and reputation, they're going to try to pretend like they're not down for having sex with you particularly without you being their boyfriend or husband. And when it comes to quickly and effectively identifying manipulative time wasters, which are women who have absolutely no interest in having sex with you, but they're willing to give you the misleading impression that you got at least a chance at getting in their pants because they want to exploit you for your non-sexual companionship and or your financial generosity, when it comes to identifying, quickly and effectively identifying those archetypes of women, there is no method, no method more effective than Mo One. None, none, no method. Marinate on that shit. Yes, sir. <laughs> Say it again. Yes, sir. Who's the king? Alan, you're the king. Say it again. Alan, you're the king. <laughs> you're dominating me. Say it again. Alan, you're dominating me right now. Mode one. Mode one. Daddy, can I go, please? You're the king. Say it again. Oh, my king. Oh, you're the fucking king. Yeah. You're the king, Alan. A.K.A. the king of verbal seduction. You know, it's the tone of your voice. How seductive your intonations are. The vibrations that you could just reach out over the phone lines and stroke a woman's breast just by the sound of your voice. How you could make her pussy so wet. Just by the sound of your voice. That's actually very hot. So you said my show was what? I said your show is powerful. Oh, say it again. Your show is powerful. I bet the king would fuck me really good. Oh, yeah. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. Oh, yeah. Who's the king? Alan Roger Curry. The king. The king. The king. The king.